series where I do a deep, but not necessarily scholarly, dive into a particular topic. And since this is a double feature, I'm going to assume that you are coming to this immediately after watching the last one, or at least shortly after, who knows. So, I'm not going to do any real big disclaimers or introductions or anything like that here. Just going to say, this episode is going to focus on a bit more how things started. Last one went into what things are at the most basic level, and now we're going to talk about how things started. So, with the context of everything being probabilistic in mind from last time, I think it is important to start off by explaining how we got to this point as far as we can tell. This is to quote ellipses question mark uh, Stephen Hawking a brief history of everything. So so the Big Bang as I said last time seems to have been caused by a massive version of what we now see on the edge of black holes in the form of particle-antiparticle pairs. However, a bit differently and much, much larger scale, as I said, so that's our best guess. We don't really know how to get any information from before the Big Bang because, well, our only way of getting information is looking around the universe. You can't see what wasn't there. So we can see the light that was there because we can look out to the edges of the universe and we know the speed of light so we can say okay right now we're looking at light from the Big Bang because it's 13 billion light years away. But as for any further, there was no light. There was nothing to see. There was no medium that we are aware of to store or transfer that information. So, when I talk about how things started, I mean the universe with the Big Bang and all of that. Near as we can tell, when the Big Bang happened, it was just this massive release of a whole lot of energy. Most of that, initially, was very, very, very high energy electromagnetic energy, which is to say, light. Uh, in fact, part of how we have tried to figure out exactly what happened back then, and part of how we have managed to prove uh, the well, expansion of space-time, or more accurately, just the expansion of space, is that we know the energy must have been released much at a much higher level, and yet all we see is the cosmic microwave background, which seems to be getting more and more stretched out, less and less high intensity, high energy, the closer it is to us, essentially. And so that kind of means there's some weird space-time stretching going on, which we already knew because we figured it out from trying to explain other things. We will get to that later. We will get to the expansion later. For now, it's important to know. Big kaboom. Lots and lots of energy was released. At the beginning, it was basically just pure energy. Not necessarily electromagnetic, not falling into any particular force category. This was in what came to sort of be called by physicists for a while the pre-split situation or the unified circumstance. There are four fundamental forces, truly fundamental. There is gravity, 
the weak nuclear force, strong nuclear force, and electromagnetism. Electromagnetism, of course, is light. Gravity is the one that we can't fucking explain no matter how hard we try. As far as we can tell, it seems to have also been the first one to split off from the others. We have managed to recreate unification conditions for every force except gravity. That is part of how we have experimentally proven that they were once one and the same. And I know that that can be a little hard to wrap your head around. At least if you have heard of the weak and strong nuclear forces. If you haven't, you have no idea what those fucking are and you can easily imagine bundling those together with light. But... At their core, these different forces are just, if you will, the cooled down fragments of what was originally one fundamental force, truly fundamental, as opposed to these sort of offshoots that you could argue are derived from. Most physicists who are working on trying to recreate unification conditions and bring in gravity think that that is going to be the key to developing a functioning theory of quantum gravity. Maybe. I don't know. I certainly don't think it'll be that easy. I think it's actually kind of going to be a bit of the reverse. We won't be able to figure out how to reach that unification condition if we even physically can while existing within a gravity well until we have a theory of quantum gravity. But just because that's what I think doesn't discount what their hopes are, and if they are right, then fucking great. I hope they get right on it and we find out that theory of quantum gravity. It's gonna take a fucking while, but we can try. Now, to explain, uh, because these are not necessarily the most familiar or common terms, so, as I mentioned, you probably haven't heard, unless you're into physics and the like, about the weak and strong nuclear forces. Unless you have heard those words in the context of nuclear weapons, in which case, yeah, okay, I guess. The weak force is the one that we would more appropriately call a nuclear force in the context of atomic nuclei going boom. It's the one that helps with fission and fusion of atomic nuclei. Specifically, it's the thing that sort of keeps protons and neutrons balanced within the nucleus of an atom, as near as we can figure. That is opposed to the strong nuclear force. Not as in a, like, oh, these forces are in conflict and whichever one is stronger determines whether the nucleus breaks apart or stays together. Rather, the weak force governs how these subatomic particles are interacting with each other, whereas the strong force determines how they interact internally. Because, as it happens, protons and neutrons are not fundamental particles. They are comprised of fundamental particles known as quarks, each of which comes in six flavors. The weak force is uniquely able to change the flavors of quarks, turning protons and neutrons, well, into each other, essentially. However, the strong force is what holds those quarks together to form a proton or a neutron. Now, we don't entirely know why these forces are the way they are. We don't know why anything is the way it is, except probability. It happened to be that way. Or, if you want to be religious about it, because God did it. That's basically what it boils down to. It's either random chance, or the divine interfering in random chance to give rise to a certain outcome. 
Neither one of those is particularly satisfying, but hey, you work with what you've got, and this is all we've got. So, with that in mind, it's also important to note that electromagnetism is light. Light is electromagnetism. And that can seem pretty tricky to wrap your head around at first. But keep in mind that the way our bodies process and transmit information is through electrical currents running along nerves. So it makes sense, then, that the thing we use to see is something that is capable of interacting with that electricity, with electrons. That is how we are able to see. Light comes in, hits the retina, and causes what's called a photoelectric effect, where the frequency of the light that hits something creates a difference in the level of energy of certain electrons, depending on the energy of the light and the particular material being hit and some other situational circumstances. Basically, light comes in, hits something, and creates not a charge, but energy. Or more accurately, it transfers the energy from the light into the electrons. And those excited electrons can be made to move around working as an electrical charge. So, when you hear about electromagnetism in the context of physics, it usually means light. Now, it's also complicated, because magnetism and electricity are kind of mutual byproducts of electromagnetism. When you have an electrical current, it creates a weak magnetic field. When you have a magnetic field and you move it, it creates electrical current. That is something important to keep in mind. The magnetic field is one of the ways that electromagnetism manifests itself. All of the fundamental forces manifest, in one way or another, as fields. That is one of their defining characteristics. You can't have a field of acceleration except through gravity. You can't have a field of, well, magnetism except through electromagnetism. You can't have a field of any non-fundamental force except through its corresponding fundamental force. You know, that, that's part of what makes them fundamental, right? The fact that they are, well, necessary and you can't break them down any more than they already are. They're sort of like the fundamental particles of forces. I almost said atoms, but you can break apart atoms, as uh, just about everyone knows at this point. Usually not the best idea, but when you need power, it's actually a pretty good idea, so long as you can contain it. Which we have a relatively good history of doing, with the exception of a few colossal fuck-ups that were caused mostly by human error and incompetence. Nuclear power is safer than most people think. Just a little PSA there. Now, with that said, so the nuclear forces, electromagnetism, gravity, they all split off from that original quote-unquote true fundamental force. That means, theoretically at least, they should be the last puzzle pieces to fall into place for our unified theory of everything. Certainly so far that has been the case for gravity, which as it happens was also the first one to split off. So, theoretically, 
it's going to be tied to that universal theory of everything one way or another. Now, that's stage one in how everything started. Stage two is that high energy stuff, essentially, started coalescing. The interference patterns of the different waves started to become stronger and stronger. And when you get enough probability of something in one place, the result is stuff. That's right, I said it. I said the most obvious thing that you could possibly say, but from a probabilistic physics standpoint, it's a bit less obvious. Essentially, all matter, even the fundamental particles, is just a hyper-concentrated form of energy. E equals mc squared, after all, although that is only for a particle that is completely at rest. When it's not at rest, obviously you have to add in relativistic velocity and energy from that, and etc, etc. Point being, uh, E equals mc squared is very accurate for a particle at rest. Everything is energy. Everything. It's just about what form that energy takes. So, for electrons, it's the electron probability field. For quarks, it's the quark probability field, etc., etc. Those fields of probability create, well, particles when they are at their most concentrated. And those hyper-concentrated probability fields giving rise to particles, well, that's how we get matter. We know that a lot of the particles that we get are not matter, but rather force carriers of some sort, or not exactly force carriers, but rather sort of helper particles in a sense. A lot of them seem to do absolutely fucking nothing, like the neutrino, which is infamous for doing absolutely fucking nothing. Uh, to the point where when we find one, it's an event. They're everywhere, they just don't like interacting. They're, they are the uh, socially anxious introverts with active camo of the particle world. They do not interact almost as a rule. When they do, it is because everything has aligned just so. Other particles are very eager to interact. For instance, the uh, famously recently discovered Higgs boson, which we are 99% sure, roughly, is the carrier, essentially, the interaction particle, more accurately, for the Higgs field, which is the source of mass. Mass, from our understanding, is not actually really a thing by itself, but rather a measure of how strongly the particle is interacting with the Higgs field. Or maybe the Higgs field is just sort of the thing on its own that causes mass to have particular effects? We are not really sure. What we do know is that what we see as the effects of mass, doing things like making it harder to move, is the effect of the Higgs field, as far as we know. But again, that's just as far as we know. And there is, of course, no guarantee that we are right. The other key thing to understand about, well, the various different sub-forces and sub-carriers is that, in the end, it's all derived from those four fundamental forces, 
and from the various fundamental particles. Between the fundamental forces and the fundamental particles, and really you could say the fundamental forces carried by their own force carrying particles are, in a sense, fundamental particles. In the end, all of it is what comes together to create the microscopic world upon which our macroscopic understanding of the world is built. The wavelengths interfere, or waveforms interfere, uh, as talked about last time, and it all builds towards what we can see and touch. Now, that is, I know it's a bit early, but that is where I'm going to call it this time. We're going to get a bit more in depth on some stuff next week. Uh, it'll be a while yet before we get to anything that sounds even vaguely familiar to people who've taken high school level physics. So strap in, buckle up, and thank you very much for listening and or watching. And I will see you all next time. Oh, 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 oh,